Hello Booktooth. Um, I am here in Plymouth as you can see. Let me zoom in. Oh no, I cannot zoom in on this screen. But yeah, I am basically ready to go in a couple of days. Right now it's not possible because we have uh, 45, uh, 45 knots of wind. So we were just doing a run over here, but as you get further into the sea, it would be um, navigational suicide, I guess, to 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 try to sail across to Portugal. Um, so at the moment we are kind of like stuck here in Plymouth. It's cool, I think I get free accommodation and, uh, and, and some free time as well to rest from one thing to the other one. I always tend to like jump from a very big project to another very big project. And I always rely on these kind of contingencies to give me a rest. Um, I, today I wanted to talk about um, other minds. I have said in one of uh, the publications, uh, like in, a, in the comments, that I that this might be my new science book, my new favorite science book. Um, I don't know about that. Uh, there are certain things that I could be doing better in this book, but it's definitely my favorite book about a single animal, uh, by far. In Dango Life, um, in terms of a, about a single living thing, could have been. Uh, could have been very close if it weren't for the fact that as much as I like some parts of it I also really didn't like other parts. In this case there is nothing I didn't really like. Um, if I had to name something I think that the, the philosophical uh, the pages that speak about the history of philosophy trying to create an analogy with, uh, with uh, um, octopuses and cuttlefish is a little bit uh, out of place. I understand that um, the writer is known uh, for a philosopher. In most cases, I find those pages to be the most interesting ones, but this was not the case. It felt out of place. I also don't tend to read a lot of these books, so this being my favorite one might not mean as much as it, someone else saying that, some other booktuber, uh, for the simple reason that most of the books that I read that talk about, that are sort of like looking at the world in a scientific way, uh, do that in a very humane way uh, in the wrong sense, in the sense of like very unaware of their own sort of like personification and, and narrowness of uh, mind. Um, uh, an example of a book uh, that does that um, and that is also about octopuses would be a well, book and documentary, it's both. It's an octop uh, my octopus teacher, which is uh, is uh, in, my in my opinion uh, a very extreme example of that in, in the bad way. Um, the reason why this book gets what it gets on my sort of like favorites list when it comes to science books about uh, animals is because um, it's very self-aware. Um, the writer is very aware of his humanity and how much that limits his capacity to understand the animal and is very respectful of um, of that animal's uh, um, environment and very aware that the fact that he's not able to reach across his own mind into a completely different cosmology um, doesn't mean that that animal is less complex or in any way has a less uh, developed intelligence. It is he is fully aware. Uh, of that and I love uh, you know uh, this book in a few pages you realize of if you if you haven't already uh, first hand like I have and I am very happy to say that I know cuttlefishes and octopuses more than I know many other animals not more than I know dogs but almost any other land animal and um, and uh, yeah I mean uh, this book this book doesn't fall short on on, on presenting them as much as a human can, uh, but it also doesn't expose them beyond their like it's it's, it's not it's not really uh, mystifying them. I think that one of the biggest problems with this book is people who I don't know if it's the blurb, but I don't think that the blurb is really misguiding. I think that is there's just been many like I've been I've seen many naive um, both critiques and and positive comments about this book that were saying something that is not in this book, uh, something that uh, we should not be looking at uh, or for because it's not the case. Um, I heard people say 
this book demonstrates that octopuses are the uh, only animals with consciousness or the opposite of that. This book, this book failed to demonstrate that the octopuses are the only animals that have consciousness. As if that was, uh, first of all, a goal of the book at all, which is not. And second of all, every animal has consciousness. Every living creature that I have come across has shown every living creature that I have interacted with has shown signs of having consciousness. I think one has to be incredibly isolated and, and lack any powers of observation uh, to not realize that, I don't know, uh, that uh, seagulls have consciousness, that every other animal has uh, that, and that uh, their inner worlds are just as rich. The interest of the octopus is not that they are smarter than other animals, which they are smarter than many other animals, but it's that they are smarting in a very different way. Because most of like, if you look at the sort of like top 10 smartest animals, and we are so interested in intelligence that uh, we do that, and we sort of like create a hierarchy of, uh, of living creatures, I think, um, depending on their uh, cognitive capacities, which <laughs> It's a, it's a mistake when we attach moral worth to intelligence, uh, which we do as well. Sort of like saying that it's not okay to kill dolphins because it's, they're very smart, but it's okay to kill other animals because they are not smart. Um, people who say that, they tend to forget about pigs, for example. But not only that, they tend to forget that there's also humans that, doesn't have, that don't have as much uh, cognitive capacity as, um, as certain animals. There's uh, humans, by humans I mean uh, kids and, and people with uh, uh, mental disabilities. So, um, we're not looking at octopuses for their cognitive capacity being greater than that of other animals, but for them uh, being among animals that have a high cognitive capacity and, in, and a very developed inner world, uh, being also the most um, alien to us, the most uh, strange uh, from us. Because cephalopods um, have nothing to do with mammals. They they have uh, our sort of like um, three life. Uh, do you say three lives? Uh, three uh, gen genealogic three. Uh, they have been basically been developing for like a genealogical line uh, for millions, thousands of years, uh, separate from ours. And they have developed intelligence. And they have developed. Um, many forms of communication that could be seen as um, analogs of, uh, of our forms of intelligence. But they are nothing like any of the other mammals or animals that, were, that are much closer on, on that uh, um, sort of like um, tree of life. Uh, so that, that is definitely one reason why they are um, interesting things to look at. Uh, this is a hard uh, video to make for me because I have only two hands. I don't have anywhere where to put my um, where to put the phone. Uh, so I'm just gonna try to single-handedly uh, read some of my notes. Uh, but yeah, like uh, when, what I what I'm referring to is like some of the things that you learn. It's just notes I write on the end on the beginning of the book generally as a as a as a, um, um, kind of summary or guide. When I pick up the book, the book again, I remember why uh, the key points of, of why I found that book valuable or whatever. Um, but yeah, like I mean, when it, when we look at like when we look at octopuses in this book, uh, some of the things that, that that you can learn and that you can see them as is like animals that can see through their skin. That's the first thing, and they can also speak through their skin. Their skin doesn't not doesn't have uh, simply a sort of like camouflage. Um, uh, capacity, but they very much um, communicate uh, through it. They they give information, not only information in the sense of like I'm creating like brighter colors because I'm angry, and I'm trying to sort of like scare you away. But um, there's a really nice uh, chapter uh, called Symphony, which shows how uh, I think it was a cuttlefish in this case that being uh, completely undisturbed and, and, and unwatched, uh, sort of like not being influenced by, 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 by any scuba diver or anything, uh, was, um, was seen uh, changing colors in a very much concerted way. Um, doing something that could be seen as a dance or some form of 
cuttlefish art and I've seen animals do things like that uh, in other cases there's there was a tribe of orcas um, a tribe of, like a, a, a pack of orcas um, a while ago that uh, had the fashion of uh, wearing um, um, dead salmon on their heads as um, as hats that's that's fashion for orcas we these people that wears dead foxes on their necks um, so um, I wasn't surprised when I when I learned about this but the description of that symphony was very beautiful and I it inspired me to write uh, a poem about it um, next time I see it uh, firsthand because I have seen I have seen that uh, firsthand already I have seen cuttlefishes changing color and in, in, in ra swimming in random directions trying to sort of like create patterns for no reason for no apparent reason and f with no apparent external influence um, so yeah I mean uh, they are fully like they are also one of the most curious creatures and and in, in, in a most uh, in like a more um, tangible way Ta and tangible in the very literal sense like uh, the way octopuses or or, or cuttlefishes not cuttlefishes so much cuttlefishes tend to keep a distance but uh, the way octopuses um, know things is by by touch. And it's very, very, very easy for an octopus, or very easy, no, but like very likely for an octopus to to reach out with an tentacle, much more than for a cuttlefish. Um, but also cuttlefishes can do this. Of like, cut, the difference is that cuttlefishes do it and then let go and, and go away, uh, generally. But um, although I've or at least that's what the book says. I have also uh, lived an instance of a cuttlefish that was very much like a cat and was sort of like swimming under my hand and uh, and then just swimming around, uh, uh, keeping sort of like a uh, touch with my arm. Um, but with octopuses, is ma this is much uh, more important because their brains, their minds are sort of like on their tentacles. And their tentacles, in a sense, they are like extended lips. Uh, so they are they are very sensitive and they give them a lot of information and uh, uh, as long as you don't present yourself as a hazard for, towards them once they are used to you that's that's something that yeah they would uh, totally they would totally do so that's very interesting as well uh, something I did not know about is uh, Octopolis is the, that uh, there seems to be something like a, a city being built or <laughs> continuously built by octopuses which is basically like a, octopuses are not so social in, in terms of uh, towards each other but there is something like a city so a city like a structure of shells where many many octopuses are incredibly unusual amount uh, meet there and uh, octopuses don't live for that long. That's a huge um, sort of like concern for this book. Is uh, why I octopus or do octopus so smart? Why do they have so such a huge brain capacity for the in terms of the proportionality to their body um, uh, size? If they only live for two years, right? Uh, so I I don't find that. I think that's a very human uh, question. Uh, I don't find it a problem. Uh, I don't. I don't very much see the predicament, although he does his best to present that dichotomy. Um, but um, what this means is that uh, cities like Octopolis that have been going on for much longer than that, have been kept through generations and even octopuses that come from the outside um, have uh, learned uh, about this place and, and kept it going with all the sort of like octopusian uh, practices that um, are involved. Um, so yeah, that's that's something interesting. Uh, octopuses build cities apart from speaking through their skin and and literally cognizing things through their touch and speaking through their color. Color is like their chromatic. Uh, they, he calls it at some point chromatic chatter. In the sense of like they seem to speak to each other and to you uh, through 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 the change of colors. I thought that was also incredibly important, incredibly interesting. Um, what else? About like one more thing about the book is that, um, of course, like there are certain parts of the book that are weaker than others. This is this book is not incredible uh, for its prose at all, and uh, and there are certain th certain things in the book that you could uh, sort of like agree or disagree with. There was another moment here similar to the one that makes me 
hate um, my octopus teacher when um, a cuttlefish was uh, um, being attacked, a cuttlefish that he had been interacting with for a while and had name and everything, and was attacked, being attacked by a seal, not not a seal, um, uh, I don't really know what animal, I mean, it might have been a seal, I don't remember now, um, and, uh, and uh, if you've watched my videos you know that a, a similar moment when the guy that did my octopus teacher um, um, had been building up a narrative of friendship towards that octopus uh, and then some um, black tail and reef sharks attacked the octopus he did nothing other than sit back and watch and, and record um, in this case this guy that has not uh, um, Build that, build up that narrative. He has not, uh, in any way, insinuated that he has a friendship with these animals, or, and at most, he has fantasized with the idea of them having some sympathy toward him, toward him, um, which is something completely uh, possible, uh, depending of his own approach to them and and, uh, and and the conditions in which he has met the, he has met them. But yeah. Uh, in this case, him not having created any sense of like moral accountability toward them by, by doing that, still tries to help the cuttlefish, which um, it was totally the cuttlefish moment to die, and like the octopus is my octopus teacher, because uh, cuttlefishes, when they die, they just start like, um, I mean, uh, they just start basically decomposing alive. And, uh, and it's a moment for them of like, I, I feel like they, 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 their, their will to life dies uh, before their body begins to die and then they are just basically like um, hanging, uh, being drifting away basically. Actually I'll, I'll read a, 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 a section about that, it's very nice, it's called Ghosts, it's one of the, my favorite chapters. My favorite chapter is the last chapter but I don't know if I should feel, read the, the last chapter so I think I'll, I'll leave it in, in just reading the chapter on Ghosts. But yeah my point is that uh, even though he didn't claim to have a friendship with these animals or anything like that, he still tried to help the octopus, uh, the cuttlefish, and then he had also the the, sensi the sensitivity to, to realize that he, because of his sheer size as a diver, uh, he was scaring more the sorry cuttlefish than than the animal that was attacking the cuttlefish uh, was scaring the cuttlefish by. By, by biting uh, of uh, its um, uh, body parts. Uh, that's because the cuttlefish was ready to die. And the animals have a very different relationship towards death than we do. Uh, but I thought it was a nice reaction and it was a moment that I found a bit problematic again because it's a, it's a tricky subject, uh, when to interact and when to not interact. Um, in this case, because, uh, because of the kind of book that this guy was writing and the kind of a relationship that, we had with, that he had with them, I think he did exactly the right thing, which was first see if the cuttlefish wanted help and when he saw that the cuttlefish did not want any help from him, uh, just let things happen and let him by himself. And, uh, and because of the kind of writer that he's been throughout, which is very humble, very very conscious of his own limitations, uh, there is, is sections where like he will give uh, two pages to counter arguments to his own ideas, uh, uh, just to present them. And so there's no manichaeism, there is no uh, looking down at you and trying to tell you his own truth that he found in the water or some bullshit like that, like I've seen divers do. Um, uh, or, or severe ignorance either, like he's, he's very well um, um, aware of, of, uh, of the savvy that he's uh, uh, communicating, much more than, again, the, the guy who did my octopus teacher. So I, maybe I should title this video um, Other Minds versus My Octopus Teacher. Um, <laughs> um, but I, yeah, I... Um, I, 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 I lost my train of thought, but yeah, I agree. I, I think it's, it's, it was a, the right approach uh, from, from cover to cover. And also, you get his philosophical um, uh, inquisitiveness, which is something I do like uh, from when, like, sometimes I don't like the philosophical chatter that uh, philosophers tend to give as um, almost like a... 
pretty good kind of uh, chapter that every science book written by a philosopher has, and sometimes by scientists as well, uh, of like, okay, and, and this is why I've learned what I've learned about the meaning of life by looking at fucking ants. Um, those chapters tend to be really bad when they are in science books. Um, just because scientists are not philosophers. And when philosophers try to be scientists, then the science part is bad. In this case, we got a little bit of that with the Vygotsky, Hume, uh, history of philosophy part. But as a whole, uh, the, you get only the best as aspect of philosophy in this book, which is his own curiosity uh, coming through and his own enthusiasm coming through the pages. And that is why this book is was so interesting. Because I was enjoying, because he was enjoying uh, a lot not only writing this book, but he was genuinely fascinated by this subject. He, not, he was not trying to tell you his amazing experiences or anything like that. He was just genuinely fascinated. There's a moment where he writes, what does it feel like to be an octopus, to be a jellyfish? Does it feel like anything at all? Which were the first animals whose lives felt like something to them? So he's, he's, these are some philosophical questions that um, might have scientific answers. Um, but uh, they guide the book from from cover to cover, and they are uh, they 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 make make him feel much richer as a, as a whole. Um, I'll still read the chapter on ghosts just because uh, I think it would be nice to just give you a sense of how the book is written. But uh, but I think so far yeah okay so he was living in Sydney and uh, there was an area uh, full of uh, ink and um, that was hanging there and he it was so much that he basically found himself like, surrounded by black and uh, so that he went the next day and uh, to look in the same area and there was no ink and then I read you. Uh, but I began to see dozens of cattlefish eggs strewn across the sand of, and at the bottom of those crevices. There was also a giant cattlefish nearby. It was an awful. It was in awful condition. Its body was mostly white, and there was much damage on the arms. It watched me, hovering, looking closer. I found three more, all quite large, clustered under a Stonehenge-like structure, with a natural rock roof that rose several meters off the bottom of the sea. So far what this is sort of like presenting is um, because the, I think the previous uh, chapter was about sex and uh, it's how closely related in cephalopods sex, the sexual life of cephalopods and their death are. And as a matter of fact, uh, sometimes the, gest the, gest the gestation period of on octopuses is longer than than their than their than their lives, <laughs> which is amazing. It's crazy. It's crazy to think that. But um, yeah, so that that was the scene that he found, and uh, he said one cuttlefish was clearly male, and the other one seemed to be female. But it was hard to tell. They were all in various stages of decay. The worst of the worst of had lost much of their skin, leaving bare, pearl white bodies underneath. Uh, with fanning and crisscross cracks like broken glass in the skin that remained. Those who had more skin were pale grey, some had eyes in very bad shape, a fifth cuttlefish with uh, some strong yellow left in her skin swimming, but five of her arms were lastly won, and there were dark wounds in the flesh that remained as we swam off, as that remained. She swam off. Uh, the cuttlefish were from approximately like um, four days there, and they seemed to be arrivals and there and there seemed to be arrivals and departures. The eggs remain down at the bottom of the crevice, lying in the dim light uh, with silt around. Finally, I was there when one of the female cuttlefishes reached the end. She was floating just outside the crevice when I arrived. A lot of her skin had been lost, with patches of orange-brown remaining. Two of her arms had gone completely, and one of her feeding tentacles hung motionless. 
She was still swimming with her fins moving gently as I watched. I realized that we were both climb, climbing a little into the, in the water column, leaving the rocky crevice. Soon two fish took an interest in her. A pink fish began to circle but did not attack. A large leather jacket was more of a problem. It came in, looked and, looked and circled, and then, be, and then began a series of attacks trying to bite pieces out of the front of the cuttlefish, even though the victim was several times larger than the attacker, because this is giant cuttlefishes that we are reading about. Um, because I think Peter Godfrey knew about cuttlefishes before, about octop before octopuses, that he started interacting with them before octopuses, which is also my case. Um, Octopuses are uh, better at uh, uh, hiding, I think, at least when you don't know where to find them. It's uh, harder to find them at the beginning and resume its assaults whenever it could. In response to the first attacks, the cuttlefish just flinched and waved arms with no effect at all. The fish kept moving. I realized that my attempts to defend the cuttlefish, and this is what I was talking about before, I didn't know that was in this chapter as well. I realized that my, my attempts to defend the cuttlefish caused more panic in the cuttlefish that, than the fish's attacks. I was too big to be that close. The leather jacket came in again a bit harder and this time the cuttlefish inked at it. The fish was not much deterred and, appro and approached again. Now the cuttlefish inked uh, more profusely and also began to spiral slowly. We, con he, we continued to rise passively in the water with the slow spiral and with grey black ink pouring out of, the, of her funnel. The cuttlefish looked like a lumbering airplane of fire, on fire. An airplane which rose rather than fell to earth, either because of the ink or the height we had now reached in the water. The fish abandoned its attacks, but this was all the cuttlefish could do. As she kept rising, the spirals stopped, uh, she came up through the last meter of water and suddenly floating in the surface completely still. The surface of the, of the water was a mess of small waves, which now sl sloshed uh, the cuttlefish back and forth. I left, it, I, I left there. The cuttlefish's death was a transition from swimming deep in her quiet world through a slow spiral, spiraling accent to drifting in the no on the noisy surface of ours. Uh, sorry for the uh, um, precarious reading toward the end especially because I just remember that it's Poetry Thursday and I haven't read a poem. So <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna finish this video quickly and, uh, and go to the sailboat, get the poetry book and, and, and read a poem. Although you will probably see this video after the poem just because it's already almost half an hour and, uh, and, uh, and I haven't even finished. Yeah, I mean, I, this is basically it. There's also there's a, the the book leaves for the end the most important subject uh, in any book of this um, of this kind, which is almost become a mandatory um, theme to touch, which is uh, the environmental. Uh, state of the ocean and um, our impact in it and uh, predictions uh, how it's affecting those animals the, in this case the octopuses but just the ocean as a whole a bit of philosophy about it a bit of um, just the eco agenda that needs to be touched because it is the most important uh, thing that we should be worrying about now um, I'm not going to read it, but I do, I do think that is the best chapter on the book. Uh, in other books, it feels more like the author is only touching that chapter because he's supposed to be touching it, because he's supposed to be talking about um, global warming and pollution and all of that, uh, because they know that uh, it is the most pertinent thing to talk about and because they know that their book will be incomplete without touching that subject. But in this case, um, in very briefly, in just a few pages, um, Peter Goffrey says everything that there is that he needs to say, uh, everything that needs to be said about it, um, in a really good way. And um, there's an anecdote that is not his; it's from other, from another biologist that was that is an, ex, an expert on bees, that I that I that he took away from him, and I take away from from him as well when he's sort of like worrying about. Um, 
the different um, pollutants and stressors that we have uh, put into into the lives of animals and it's uh, basically how like in some uh, region of uh, North America uh, there are uh, bees are have st stopped working and um, by stop working I mean they stop pollinating completely and farmers have had to uh, transport their flowers uh, to like miles across to get um, the few bill to get to the few bee colonies that still pollinate so that their flowers keep growing and and, uh, and germinate and everything um, and for a few months or years I don't know for how long but basically people was going crazy uh, thinking of what is the thing that has made bees change from one day to the next and suddenly stop pollinating many many colonies across miles and miles and miles suddenly stop pollinating basically uh, a death sentence for the flora of that area um, and and this guy who's the um, who's like the ex the the most the an eminence and the expert on on bees on uh, one of the number one in the world supposedly or at least in the in that area says at some point uh, that uh, finally he realized that it, there was not single uh, variable or factor there was no sudden change on the bees life that made them stop uh, working it was that it was the cum cumulative effect of um, of multiple stressors uh, contamination noise pollutants uh, parasiting their work by taking honey from them uh, that they had been putting up uh, through two decades or more and that uh, and then he was basically explaining how like a species can put up with multiple stressors more than they're able to handle on the long term for a long time but uh, when the longer but uh, eventually they just stop eventually they just run out of uh, that uh, spare energy that they had as a as a species to deal with those kind of uh, events when once they there's sort of like uh, biological uh, mechanisms realize that this is a thing that is not uh, temporary but it's sustained. The bees just suddenly lose uh, their energy and their capacity to pollinate, um, which means that we could be beyond the point of no return for many other species that will just begin to die, um, not for things that happen today, but for things that have been happening for the last 10 years. And by stopping today, it wouldn't necessarily save them. Um, yeah, I mean, that's maybe not the most optimistic note to end a, a video like this, but maybe it shouldn't be. Maybe we should be a bit more realistic about the situation of things. And I don't know, like uh, the other day, I, uh, a video uh, appeared recommended on my on my feed, on my YouTube feed about how like they made us this three mile structure or something like that, that is basically picking up plastic from the ocean and it's like and I saw the comments most people saying like uh, nice there's good people in the world or yeah finally uh, now we are fine basically um, and uh, we are not fine and uh, every time I see an initiative like that I'm always like that's amazing I just wish that that didn't represent a 0 0.00001 of the effort that we could be making as a species to not destroy the place in which we live and wipe out every other single living creature before us and consequently ourselves afterwards. I'm gonna leave it there. Uh, this was a good book, I enjoyed it. Uh, there was there's plenty of information here. Uh, it is enjoyable, the enthusiasm of the writer comes across. Um, if at some point there are some parts that are a bit more um, uh, dense, unnecessarily dense, which uh, I don't think there was any part that was necessarily dense. I just think that maybe there was a couple of chapters that, we, that could be skipped. Feel free to skip them. But as a whole, the most uh, relevant book I've seen in terms of uh, in terms of uh, octopuses, and uh, maybe one of the books that is most that I've read that is, or maybe the book that is most uh, able to um, look at animals for what they are. Um, being aware that you are looking from your eyes with your own prejudices, biases, and and, and limitations of, of of perspective. So yeah, definitely read it. Other minds, I recommend it.